Well, welcome to Corning Museum of Glass and our amphitheater hot shop. You can see from the signs down here on the amphitheater floor, we are live streaming. So I want to take a moment and welcome our viewers who are watching us online. Uh, so today we have a very special visiting artist. We have Courtney Dodd and her assistant, George. Let's give them a nice round of applause. Thank you very much. Courtney is going to be making a vessel or a vase that we have on this far end of the stage. So maybe we could pull that up for our live streamers, uh, but here we go. So this is a frosted vase or frog vase, and this is part of Courtney's production line. Um, for those of you who are in the amphitheater right now, we have a few of her, a uh, few little bits of information if you'd like to pull them up, a business card, that type of thing. So as glassmakers, we can make our own artwork, but then we also make work that we can make rapidly and sell to the public. So this is one of her production pieces. Um, we'll see a lot of blown glass and colored glass. Uh, we have people from our team up here too. We have Teresa Jorgensen who's going to be helping out. And my name is Heather Spiewak. I am the person to ask questions. I'm out here in the audience. If you have a question, don't hesitate to raise your hand. Uh, you could do a dance and I won't complain. That will get my attention just as fast. Uh, but also for our live streamers, if you have a question, we have Amanda on the computer and she will relay those questions to me if she cannot answer them herself. So is everybody ready for a great demonstration? Yeah. yeah. Good, thank you, thank you. I'm going to start off, how many of you have seen a demonstration today or at some point in your lives? Perfect, most of you, that's great. Well, welcome, this one will be special. It will be one of a kind as it is Courtney up here on our stage. Now, George has picked up a little bit of colored glass. And Courtney, is this the same color that you have in your vase that's on the stage? Yes, yeah. yeah. it'll be exactly the same. Perfect, all right. So it should be a little bit of white colored glass. Now he's inside of our garage right now. The garage has a cold side and a hot side. We loaded the color bar into the cold side of the garage. You can see we have the flu. Now he's heating up in the hot side of the garage where we have the flame, the burner. And we have to preheat this colored rod we can't just take it out in the room open, or open air, stick it up onto a pipe and try to use it. First of all, the cold glass will not stick to hot glass or a hot pipe. It would pop apart and we wouldn't be able to use it. So very, very important, especially for a bar of this size to slowly preheat it. Now George will come out in a moment and you'll see how large this bar of glass is. There we go. And it is white glass, so white is a fairly stubborn color. It will look fairly true uh, to what it's going to be tomorrow, even though it's close to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, this is a really great way to get an even coating of color. So here we have a great piece. This has been in call mode. So if we ignore the middle band here, we've got this great, beautifully saturated orange top on our vase. Now this was done using the color bar that George has just picked up. We have many different ways to apply color to the pieces. The rabbit down here, for instance, there's a little bit of powdered glass in that and frit, small little chunks of pre-colored glass, which the majority of our pieces up here are made from. Now Courtney has picked up a blowpipe. Now this is a hollow stainless steel blowpipe She's preheating the end of it so that when she goes into the furnace, the hot glass will stick to the blowpipe. Just like our color rod wouldn't stick to the hot glass if it wasn't preheated, if you do not preheat a blowpipe, the glass will repel away from it for a moment inside of the furnace. You'll also be able to see a kind of a layer between the glass and the rod. And also cut down on your working time because the metal will start to suck away the heat from the clear glass very rapidly. So George will take a moment. He's using our marvering table. This is a very large stainless steel table. 
you can roll back and forth and shape the, cl uh, the color rod into the form that Courtney is looking for. But we use the most common clear glass in the world. It's called soda lime glass. It's made out of three main ingredients, silica, soda ash, and limestone. To get colored glass, chemists add different metallic compounds or basic elements from the periodic table. For a white, you can use tin or antimony fluoride to make it opaque, that type of thing. I will disclaim to you that I am a glass blower first and not so much a chemist. So these are, these are recipes that the chief scientist here at Corning Museum of Glass has thrown at me uh, just so I can answer a few questions. How do you get red? So red can come from cadmium or selenium, but a deep cranberry red can be from gold chloride. Yeah. Yeah. So the question online is, how do you tell the temperature of the glass, especially the white glass, if it doesn't glow so much when it's hot? So when our clear glass comes out of the furnace, it has a brilliant orange glow. Now the white glass, when it is close to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, will have a slight orange tint to it. But a skilled glassmaker like George can feel how the glass is moving off the end of the rod. The more it is moving, the hotter it is. And they will both have to be constantly turning the pipe or rod that they're working off of to keep the glass on center. So you can tell the temperature a little bit by how it glows, but a skilled glassmaker can really observe the glass. It'll move differently. Sometimes at certain points, it sounds different as well. Yeah. Yeah, how do we keep the heat from coming up the pipe? Well, stainless steel is a poor conductor of heat, plus the heat is rising up. Now, when Courtney goes into the furnace, if she takes a large gather and she has to be inside of the furnace longer to pick up more glass, she can use the pipe cooler that we have down on the stage. It's a trough that fills up with water and carries the heat up in a, in a steam bath away from the pipe. Um, in the blowpipe that she's working off of as well, there are two different types of steels. The head is a hollow. They're both hollow, but they're made out of two different types of steels. The, the head keeps the heat a little longer. It doesn't really dissipate up towards through that other steel. Um, and again, I'm not a machinist metal person, but the stainless steel I know for sure is a poor conductor of heat. Yeah. Uh, we do have different size pieces or different sized pipes to accommodate different amounts of glass. Um, I've heard of glass blowers using the wrong sides of pipe and having that weld break from the, the weight of the glass itself. Did you have a question down here? No? Okay, all right. So here we just saw Courtney start a bubble just by trapping a little breath of air. And she is using clear glass, so you saw it rise up into the material. Did everybody catch that? All right, we've got a great AV team. They'll really follow the action around for you. And now that Courtney has a bubble, they're going to lay the white glass on top of it and then roll that white glass over the bubble. So the question is, when drilling a hole into cold glass, cold being room temperature, is there a way to ensure that the piece of glass will not shatter? Um, I'll bring Courtney's piece back to your attention for just a moment after they do their overlay, or underlay as it's called in Sweden. Here we go, let's watch the, the overlay here, and then I'll answer that question a little more in depth. So they'll heat up the glass and use gravity to cover up this bubble. Oh, well, maybe I'll go back to the vase. There you go. So she'll shape it one time. Now, Courtney, inside of her vases, she does cut a hole in the top of them. So she has numerous holes in the top. And if you get a second, I'm actually, would anybody like me to pass one of these around? All right, I'll pass these around. Um, you can see one of her other vases. So we'll pass it. Can you see it? 
Here we go. We'll pass it. Um, there are holes, and Courtney does do this cold. For drilling in the cold glass, we want to make sure of a couple of things. One, water is pretty important. Um, I haven't seen Courtney cut into her piece, but I know that when I'm cold working glass, it's important to have water running on the drill bit that you're using. This not only keeps the silica away from your mouth and lungs, but it also cuts down on the friction created by the tool you're using to drill into the glass. Uh, now, cold working is pretty tricky. A lot of glass blowers won't try it. They will not risk cutting into a piece of glass they have made in the hot shop. That's because it can crack and break your piece. But as long as you're using the right tool for the job, you have a little bit of water, I'd say it's not terribly risky. We all just saw that overlay. Kind of looks like a hat right now. Well, Courtney will probably use our marvering table here. She can use a variety of tools to continue the white glass around the entirety of the bubble. There you go. Once Courtney is done with this piece as well, not only does she drill away uh, one of the bulbs that she puts on her vase, but she also sandblasts the glass. Anyone try sandblasting today? here at the museum? No? It's a project you can do here. Uh, but sandblasting the glass is taking an air compressed gun that's filled with grit. And there are many different abrasive grits out there. She says she takes it to about a 600. So it gives the glass this frosty look. It takes away its sheen, but it is still fairly smooth to the touch. There you go. She used a tag to roll that glass back. Make sure it is nice and even around the bubble. What do you all think? Did she do a good job? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Courtney will make this look easy. It's apparent to me that she has a lot of experience as a glassmaker um, because that is not something a beginning glassmaker can do in just a single heat. They have to go back and forth between the furnace to get that to roll all the way over their bubble. A question here? Yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of equipment up here in the amphitheater hot shop. This is one of the best hot shops to work out of, not only in my opinion, but because it is state of the art. So we have three furnaces on the stage, four furnaces actually that are running. We have two melting furnaces here at Corning Museum of Glass. The middle furnace runs at 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit and it holds about 1,000 pounds of clear molten glass. There's a furnace on the far end of the stage by Teresa, and that furnace holds all, right now, blue glass, a copper blue glass, electric blue, if you will. It's slightly smaller, it holds maybe 200 pounds of that blue glass. Uh, we have two other furnaces, they have circular openings called reheating furnaces, or glory holes, each one is right, but they're just big chambers of heat to get the glass back up to a workable temperature. We have another reheating furnace that is off, and we have a powder booth as well. The powder booth is attached to the hood. So don't, by all means, don't feel like you are stuck in your seats. It's actually kind of nice to walk around the amphitheater because there is not a bad view in the house. A lot of glass blowers will sit up in that corner during live events, because not only do you get a view of the television monitors up above you, but you get a bird's eye view over Courtney and what she's doing as well. So Courtney is using a Dremel to get away any impurities or even bubbles that she may have found in the glass itself. She'll get rid of texture, because if there is any texture or bubbles in the glass, it will translate throughout the rest of the piece as an air pocket or bubble. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Yeah, how do they know what temperature uh, they need to put it back into the oven? That is all based off of experience. Uh, so here at the museum, we like to say it takes about three to five years to be a good, a decent glass blower, uh, a good beginner. And I don't want to offend anybody. It does depend on the person and where you work and what you're doing with your career. But the more time you spend in the furnace, the more time you spend in a hot shop like this, 
the more experience you get, the more observation over the material. So you will eventually learn all of these things. As a beginner, you might start off by counting down 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, and realizing when the glass either starts to break or get too cold to shape. That tells you to go back to the furnace. As a skilled glass blower, that kind of becomes second hand, second nature, to know the temperature of the glass and when you have to go into the furnace or come back out. And again, that's something you can really get by the feel. Um, one of the best things I've learned working here at Corning Museum of Glass is to work hotter, not harder. If you try and blow a bubble into a cold piece of glass, you're just going to turn red in the face. But the hotter you can get the material, the more shaping you can get done with it. Um, another reason I love working here at Corning Museum of Glass is that there's been a lot of Stuben glass blowers that still work here at the museum. Um, to give you an idea of why we say it's about three to five years to be a decent beginning glass blower is because at Stuben, they had an apprenticeship of six years or 12,000 man hours before you could sit at the bench and call yourself the gaffer like Courtney is of this project. So Courtney is the gaffer. She is the foreman, the leader of the project. Uh, this is a term you'll find a lot in glass making. It might even be a term you notice in the credits after a movie, if any of you still watch those. Right? That might roll up as gaffer, and that normally means the lead electrician on that movie itself. But for us, it means the foreman or the leader of the project. This is Courtney's piece. This is her line of work, so she is the gaffer. A gaffer is a word that's derived from the old English word gaffner, which meant grandfather. Uh, Courtney does not look like a grandfather to me. So it has lost the end over time and its meaning for the grandfather. Uh, traditionally, this would be a career where you followed in your father's footsteps. So the oldest, wisest person in the shop calling all the shots could have been your grandpa. All right, so going back into the furnace, if you watch your television monitors, we'll roll you a short animation. Uh, for those of you on our live stream, don't forget, you can ask us questions, but I hope this is rolling for you as well. It's a wonderful animation. It kind of takes away the mystery of our furnace. I've been asked, is the glass floating around in there like cotton candy? Is it on different shelves that you kind of poke up? But no, it sits in the bottom of the furnace like honey sits in the bottom of a jar. And we gather the glass up the same way you would gather honey out of a dish. So she took that now white bubble, pushed it into the surface of the molten glass, turned in one direction, and she has a nice new skin or gather of glass around her piece. Now to me, this does not look like quite enough glass. So she'll probably do that maybe one or two or even three times, it's all up to Courtney. And she needs to get the right amount of material to make the size piece that you see behind me. So again, for those of you just joining us on the live stream, this is Courtney Dodge. She has her assistant, George, up here. We are working together to make this lovely vase that you see on the far side of the screen. So I know a lot of you are interested in what she's making. Yeah, another question. How heavy does the rod get? Well, we have a lot of different rods here at the museum and pipes. Like I said, they accommodate uh, different amounts of glass. We have what's called a cup pipe. It goes to standard and then extremely large. So here I might pull out a couple of them for you. Just so you can see the difference in diameter. I would say that they really range anywhere from a couple of pounds, maybe even just a pound, to five to 10 pounds. And the one that I'm bringing out, maybe even pretty close to 15 pounds. So you can see, this would make a smaller piece of glass, and this one would make a much larger piece of glass. And the larger blowpipe I have in my hand, you can even see the weld at the bottom here, that stainless steel, and then where rust has begun to come out, uh, just because we don't use this pipe quite as much as we use this pipe here. Um, so they can get fairly heavy. It looks like Courtney is probably working on a pipe that's maybe two to five pounds. But that is a, a great observation. You know, the weight 
it does start to build as we get different layers of glass on the end of the blowpipe. But once Courtney has her final layer or gather of glass, she's not only picking up and turning maybe a five pound blowpipe, but she might have another two to five pounds off the end of that blowpipe. Now this is not material that is holding still. It will start to move and flow with every movement that Courtney puts down on the blowpipe. Uh, so when, when she does have all the glass she wants and that core starts to reheat, uh, the glass will start to fight her. And she can't hold all this material close to her center of gravity. It's off the end of a four foot pipe or five foot pipe. So it becomes heavier and heavier. Another basic formula I have been given is that it feels maybe about four times heavier than if you could hold it close to your body and uh, not, not turn it. Because turning is one of the most difficult things to learn. This is that pipe cooler. Courtney is cooling it down because she's about to go back into the furnace. Uh, to cool it down first is a great way because, you know, once the pipe is hot, it's hot. She cools it down now, so she goes into the furnace. When she comes back out, the pipe is just going to be cooler than if she hadn't cooled it down. She can go back in with a wider stance, get her, her left hand as close to the glass as possible so she can support the weight. Um, so with a pipe like the larger one, you can imagine it'd be, it's very good to have a nice wide stance to be able to control the glass. I can barely hold the pipe at the very end without it dropping down to the ground. I have no control over the material. And not only that, but holding the glass at a downward angle will start to elongate the form. If you wanted to make a short bowl, squat bowl, it'd be very difficult to do when you've already uh, stretched it out. You can really see how stubborn that white glass is in the center of the clear. It really does not like to change color. But the glass around it is orange, so we know that it is fairly hot, around that 2,000 degree Fahrenheit mark. What is that spoon thing made out of? It's made it out of cherry wood. Of all the things to shape molten glass, I know you thought of wood first, right? The cherry wood block, that's what it's called, the block, is soaked in water. Since it's made out of cherry wood, it holds that water very well. Because fruit woods take a long time to grow, the grain is very concentrated. So in the water log tools, it holds the water well. It burns away evenly in our dry wooden tools. Um, it's a, and it smells good. There's also no there's very little resin in the wood. You could imagine a wood like pine up here. That would smoke up instantly. It would leave scratches in the glass because of the grain. It would also leave dirty, ugly, scuzzy marks on the surface of the glass. Do I have another one from you? You got it? Yeah. Yeah, people are always worried about our hands and holding on to stainless steel pipes that have 2,000 degree Fahrenheit glass off of it. Um, wearing gloves really cuts down on the dexterity, so you're right. Uh, they, they tend to get in the way. On our right hand, too, we have a lot of wet tools. You get that right hand glove soaking wet, you can get a steam burn around the entirety of your hand before you know it. Now, a common thing I've seen, and this is more of a West Coast thing, um, is to wear gloves while turning very large pieces of glass. These gloves are more like uh, what batters use to swing the bat. They're very skin tight. Some of them are made out of leather. They can still feel the blowpipe underneath of their hands and just get a better grip. When we use larger pipes and glass starts to get really, really hot, you can imagine that some people might sweat or glisten, right? If you sweat, your hands are slippery. It's very hard to control the pipe, so they have been throwing on those gloves. Um, a piece like these, too, 
I know to get that intricate pattern in there, uh, the gaffer will throw on a glove on their right hand, but that's only for the moment that they're putting the pattern in. It's only for getting very close to the material and putting these details into the glass. Yeah, your question? What's the hose thing? So when she's blowing on the glass, yeah, so Courtney can use compressed air to cool the glass down. As she's cooled the glass down, she's cooled the pipe down, that tells me she's ready to go in for another gather, another layer of glass. Now if the bubble is too hot and Courtney went back into the furnace, she could drop all of that glass right back into the furnace. And then we'd have a blob of white floating around somewhere. Um, I'll admit it, actually, I dropped, uh, this was on a cruise ship, a bar of white glass, I swear, it jumped off of the pipe and went into the furnace and it sunk straight to the bottom. But it burned off. We never found it. It was gone. So it all depends on the metal it is. Uh, but she wanted it cold so that the glass could coat the bubble underneath. Yeah. How many can she put out in a day? Courtney, how many of these can you make in a day? So many. She says so many. <laughs> yeah, so many. Um, we're already about a half hour into this, so I'm guessing it might take another half hour or so. If, if she takes, huh? A little bit longer, maybe an hour or so. Uh, but could do the math. If it takes an hour and a half to make the piece of glass, then if she works eight hours a day, she can make five to six. Sure. Yeah, I'm a glass blower too, so my math might be off. You want to uh, double check? Yeah, it's very physical, uh, and you know that's why a lot of beginning glass blowers kind of drop out because there is a big learning curve. You have to get over the fact that you're standing in front of a 2,000 degree Fahrenheit furnace. You have to get over the fact that you're going to break a lot of glass before you can make a lot of glass that looks good because we all learn through trial and error. And again, some people will pick this up faster than others. It's like, it's like a musical instrument. The more you practice it, the better you're going to sound. Anyone can do it as long as they practice. But then, of course, you have those people that are just naturally attuned to, to that instrument. Very good. Awesome questions down here. I'm sorry. Oh, hi, Catherine. From Glass Barge, all the way from Glass Barge. Miss you. Yeah, that's another really common question. Is there a team that's always working together? Typically, we will work in a team. Um, it's kind of like a team sport, you know, just like an instrument can be a part of the orchestra. As the pieces start to get larger and larger, it helps to have hands that can jump in and help out. Uh, so they do, if they do need an extra set of hands, I'm here, I can jump in. Um, so yeah, it really helps. There are people, though, that work alone. That's how they've trained themselves. So they can, I've even seen someone make a piece of glass like this, but all by themselves. Um, and then, of course, there are people who like to work on much larger teams. 10 to 15 people make larger and larger pieces of glass that require more hands on deck. Uh, like when we use that larger reheating furnace, the one that is turned off. Um, I've seen some really amazing pieces of glass come out of that furnace. A, a life-size sea turtle. And with that, uh, Raven Sky River and Martin Yunetsky came out, and they had people jumping all over the stage to make this thing. Uh, there were people shielding the gaffer from the heat. There were people you know, running around getting doors, that type of thing. So yeah, once the piece gets bigger, there becomes more jobs. Another question? Yeah, burn yourself often. No, you don't want to burn yourself often. It hurts. It hurts a lot. I might say in the beginning, you can get kind of overconfident, maybe nick yourself here or there, uh, but you learn quickly not to do it. And typically when you do get burnt, it's off of a metal tool, not the glass itself. Common sense says the glass came out of a furnace. That's 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It is hot. Don't touch it. Um, a lot of people will nick themselves on the tools 
Because visually, a tool can be extremely hot, but it doesn't mean it's going to glow red. Uh, I like to compare it to a chef in the kitchen. You know, you, a chef might be at home making dinner for their family. There's no rush. Um, but you throw them into a restaurant, and it becomes dinner hour. They start working faster and faster. They might get a, a little grease burn, uh, bacon kiss, that type of thing, a little nick from, from a hot spatula or pan. But they don't do it very often. Yeah. You learn not to get burnt. The most common burn I've seen is off of the tool that Courtney is using right now. Those are called jacks. Uh, they're tong-like. They're very thin. They're also coated in beeswax. Um, but a lot of glass blowers will flip them around and use the back of them to paddle. So both sides of this tool can be hot. And when you go to paddle with the jacks, the blades, they line up with the nice sensitive part of your forearm. And with a jack burn like that, not only do you get a little blister, but there's a little line of beeswax there, too. Uh, so that's the most common thing I've seen. You won't, you won't see it here today. I don't want to jinx them. But you know, it, it takes, takes some time to learn. But we're all professionals here. You won't, you won't really see it. Thanks for worrying about us. Uh, you know, Courtney, how old were you when you started? Lamp working when she was 19, and then glass blowing? Uh, I don't know. But, uh, don't know. <laughs> so how, how many years of glass blowing do you have, you think? Uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you focus. Ten or eleven, ten or eleven years. You lose track, don't you? It's just so much fun. I always forget to add a year or two when they've passed. Who wants to do that? Right. Yeah, lots of experience. She'll make it look easy. Yeah. What is that pad? That rag or pad? You know, that is a tool. It is called newspaper. Yeah, it's a pad of newspaper. Um, we'd like some people will take seven sheets. Some people will take ten. How many do you like? Ten. Ten is perfect. I like to go to thirteen sometimes, but it gets a little thicker. Yeah, it's a, a special glass blower origami. Some people will fold the paper into thirds and then thirds again. I've seen some people fold it into fourths and then thirds. Some people like to cut the corners off. I'm not one of those people. But every glass blower is different with how they make their paper uh, very specific or not specific and use the tools that are given to them. Yeah. So that newspaper pad, it's also soaked in water. You can see you're squirting it with water, too. Um, you will not really feel heat from the newspaper unless there's a, a crack in it or a rip. Sometimes if it's a little too wet so that water can start to over hold the heat from the glass. And that will, is what starts to heat up, not the, the paper itself. So remember, all that heat's rising up and away from her. Yeah. It is newspaper. It is not just newsprint. It is the Corning leader. And that is why it's special. It is local. We love it. We will support them until they stop printing on newspaper. Uh, because I think it might be difficult to use an iPad to shape molten glass. Yeah, newspaper, it works great. You know, some people are also very particular about what type of newspaper they will use. Um, I've heard the Chicago Tribune or the Wall Street Journal, but as long as there's not a lot of ink, like for me, I wouldn't use the comic section. Uh, just a bunch of folded up comics. One, they're funny. Why, why throw them away? Two, that ink can leave ash on the glass, which you'll either have to burn away or it can leave scars, especially if you're using it in the surface on fresh molten glass. Um, so the, I, I'm a fan of the less, less colored ink, the better, just because there's, so there's so much chemically that can go on and stick to the glass. You'll, you can leave an imprint of the tool on the material. Now, there is another tool that someone decided to create, 
and it's called a got pad. It's made out of graphite, graphite fibers woven together. It's also soaked in water. It's another really great tool you can use with your hand. Um, I find that it cools the glass down a lot faster than the newspaper. And depending on the type of it, you can't really use it on fresh molten glass because you will leave kind of these little hairs or fibers in the material itself. So there are different tools we can use to shape the glass with our hands. But I think a regular old newspaper just works the best. And the Corning leader is fairly, it's a good one. It's a good one. I'm from Chicago, so I like the Chicago Tribune. Yeah. Yeah. So this is fairly typical. You'll see them working together. Um, George is helping inflate the glass. This allows Courtney to do all the shaping and watching the glass where it's inflating um, while, while George is blowing it up. So that way, she can really shape it from the inside and the outside at the same time. She also has a bird's eye view over the shape itself. So instead of hanging the glass down and blowing at the end of the blowpipe, one, it's not elongating itself from that angle change. Um, and two, she can really press with the newspaper and make a nice straight line down, down the vessel. Oh, oh yeah? Let, let me try. Let's see. Is it possible to mold Gorilla Glass into shapes that we use here? I would argue that yes, you could, but no, I wouldn't, because it's expensive. And um, why, yeah, why, why would you? Yeah, it's, it's meant for flat screens. The way they make Gorilla Glass is they fill up a trough, um, and then that trough, trough fills up and spills over the edges. It then cools enough to where, when it comes back and touches itself, it's never touched another surface on the outside. Yes, on the inside where the plates have come together, they've touched the trough, but on the surface, there are no impurities because it hasn't been touched. Now, before the glass has been poured through the trough, you could play with it, sculpt it, shape it. Um, but to make Gorilla Glass, I've been told that they chemically temper it. That's what makes it Gorilla Glass. Uh, so Gorilla Glass is then, after it's made into its pane, it is tempered by running it through a bath, a salt bath. This takes the smaller sodium ions out of the glass and replaces it with larger potassium ions, which creates a, a huge pressing force on the surface of the material, making it extremely strong and scratch resistant. Um, but it still does have tension on the inside, so when it does break, that's why it breaks in many, many little slivers or shards. I guess it depends on how hard you drop your phone or iPad, but I've noticed that when I drop mine, it does tend to, of course, shatter in the most impossible way, worst way possible, so that I cannot look through the screen and still use it. Yeah. So we're getting there. We're getting to the, the length of our piece. Um, you can see, if you look very closely up on the screen, she does have a I don't know, I would say about a half inch, maybe even a whole inch of clear glass off the tip of this bubble. Now that's because it's going to become the base of the vase, right? So in order to create a hollow vessel in this manner, we need a way to blow up the glass, and we do that off of the blowpipe. They'll flatten off the bottom of this bubble, punty it up, or use a secondary rod called a punty and transfer the piece off of the blowpipe so that she can start to add uh, the decorative details on the top. All right, I'll ask her in just a moment. I don't want to interrupt. Yeah, question here? In the furnace? OK, I'll answer that in just a second. Let me ask Courtney. Do you, do you pop the or put the bumps in before you punty it? Or you, you punty it and then put them in? Yep. 
That's the last thing you do? Okay. Just want to make sure. So we will put those bumps in uh, after the punty. Now, uh, the question was, what's the type of glass inside of the furnace? It is a, a regular camera behind it. There's a window of fused silica in front of it. That plate of fused silica is about a half inch centimeter thick. It is made out of glass, but it doesn't melt in our furnace because of how pure it is. So that glass melts at around 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit because it is pure silicon dioxide. Uh, it is a wonderful view. It's used for, for many things, and that view is definitely my favorite, but I am biased. I will admit it for that. It is used still in some spacecraft shuttle windows and optical fiber because of that purity. Yeah, fused silica was invented here in Corning, New York in 1934. Um, so it does have many applications. We also share the city of Corning, New York with Corning Incorporated, who are responsible for that Gorilla Glass I mentioned earlier, and a lot of technology and innovation in glass today. Yeah. Yeah, she has a, a tube on the end of the blowpipe, and she's in holding the pressure in the glass. She can also blow into the glass wall, she's marvering. Uh, so the marver table is a wonderful tool. As long as she rolls in an even form, holds the same angle constantly while she does this, she can blow and inflate the glass, and get a really nice clean line, and force the bubble just slightly taller. Because the air cannot really push too much against the marver and the steel of the marver, the marver's also cooling those edges down. The air has nowhere else to really go except to the tip of the bubble. So this is a good way to get a little height. She's being, being very careful not to blow too hard because you don't want to blow the bubble straight out the bottom of the piece or get a nice thin, thin bottom. You don't like those as glass blowers because you set your base or vase on a table and then the bottom breaks out. That's no good. You could throw it in the garden and pot, or like plant plants in it, but that's really all it's good for. You can't use it inside. So she's got really nice straight edges. You can tell there's a lot of things that you can look for. Not only the white surface of the glass and how straight the object is, but in college I was also taught to look at the light in the glass and the reflection of the lights from above onto the surface of the material. The lights, yes, they're round here, but if they make a nice straight line on the piece with no undulation, no dips or divots, you have straight walls. Yeah, it's another thing to look for. It's, you know, we're observing a lot of things when we're making a piece of glass. You can make those lines out here in that shot. Oh, what a great shot, perfect. Nice straight light, line, light lines in the surface of her piece. The blades of the jacks are nice and straight. The board is nice and straight. Turning at an even, even pace, she'll get a nice flat foot or bottom. She also still has the blow hose attached to the pipe so she can blow at the same time as shaping the sides. The jacks are not catching on fire. Remember, they're coated in beeswax. That's why you see flames shoot off of them. There we go, and back to the furnace. All right, so finishing up the bottom of the piece. Once she's happy with the bottom of the form, we'll go ahead and do that punty or transfer. A really nice, simple, elegant form. But remember, we are going to put that decorative top on. Did, did this go around? Did everyone get to see the postcards? We also have business cards down here for Courtney and her shaker and salt business 
postcard as well. It gives you a little more information about her. I'll pass around this one too. You can read a little bit more. She has a, a few different kind of companies, I guess you'd call it. You got Salt and Shaker and then Little Dipper. Huh? Oh, Little Dipper, yeah. So she makes a few lines of work. Yeah, the color and patterning usually always happens at the very, very beginning. So they did take white glass and roll it over a bubble. If she wanted to put more pattern in, like the lines you see on this piece, um, the bunny rabbit, you know, this piece was all done, that color was all done at the very, very beginning. There are different ways we can work with glass. You can take lines or cane, take a bar of glass and stretch it right across the entire stage. Then we take that cane or that entire rod and chop it up into segments that are kind of like pencil length and width. Then we can line those up on a plate, heat them up, fuse them together, roll them into a cylinder, and then close off the end of the cylinder on a blowpipe. Then you have a bubble with all the different types of lines. These pieces in the front were all done by feathering. Right, so they take the white glass and then they wrap a coil of glass around the entire thing all the way down to the bottom. And they take a pick and drag through those lines in both directions, creating a feathered pattern. Uh, kind of like in frosting on a cake, you can do that. Uh, fancy latte art, they do that as well. She just drilled through the bottom of her bubble with a tungsten rod. She heated up that tungsten rod and pushed it through the glass. Tungsten is great for shaping glass because you can get it hot enough to move the glass around, but as long as you have it at just the right temperature, the glass isn't going to stick to the tungsten. Now, because she is putting on these kind of bulbous forms, these little bumps on the top of her piece, she needs a way to blow through the form. So I'm guessing, I've never seen her make one, but I'm guessing that she's going to put a blow pipe on the bottom of this vase as the punty. And she'll be able to inflate the glass uh, from the other side. As she is controlling the temperature of the piece, you saw her using the propane torch. So we have a couple torches up here. One is propane and the other is natural gas assisted by oxygen. The smaller torch that's not on right now goes a little hotter, around 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It is bright blue. And then the propane torch is just a, a broad and encom encompassing heat. So she can really heat that shoulder of the piece so that it survives the transfer. So this is where that experience becomes extremely necessary. If the top of the piece, if it's too cold, they can still successfully catch this on the punty that George is creating. But when George puts that back into the furnace, this whole entire piece could pop, break. I've even seen pieces explode during this part of the process. There's no pressure. I'm sure she's done this many, many hundreds of times before. So this will be a special type of punny. Be more of a collar of glass around the blowpipe, so they will be able to blow through the blowpipe still. What causes the torch fire to be very red when it hits the glass? I'm guessing it's the temperature and the way the light is bouncing off of the glass and back through the flame. That is an interesting question. I haven't, I haven't heard that one before. I can see it. It might also be the lens. Uh, because here in the amphitheater hot shop, that looks very, very orange to me. It doesn't look as red as what it is up on the television monitors. And she's also using the tip of the flame. And when she does pull that, if it's not touching, touching the glass, it would still go from blue to orange. 
Okay, so it looks like we're getting just about there to transfer the piece. Really managing the temperature. You know, there's not a lot of glass blowing or inflating. It's really all about controlling the temperature of the glass. Getting it hot where you want it to move around, keeping it cold at different stages, depending on how much shaping you're ready to do. So over at the other bench, George has picked up a blowpipe. He has a little bit of clear glass. This just runs around the opening. He doesn't want a bubble off the end of this pipe. If there's a bubble, there'll be a little layer of clear between the base of Courtney's piece and, and the punty itself. She will not be able to blow through it. So very important not to close this up. Normally, we'll use a punty that looks like a Q-tip as well, oh, more of a dome-shaped punty. This gives a little more surface area. It'll stay a little hotter for longer. This ring or collar punty will break off really nicely because it doesn't have as much of a connection. So a little bit of communication. I think most of you will notice here in the amphitheater that they they really haven't been talking very much, right? or you can't really hear it. But they've made so many of these pieces together. George knows where he needs to be, at what time, when to create the punty. Courtney knows the temperature of the glass, so she goes back to the reheating furnace, just making sure it's hot enough to survive being out in the open air, long enough to place the punty on. Yeah, all that is determined by, she knows that by her experience. Uh, the glass isn't moving around very much anymore. It is very, very white. Um, even that clear bit of glass off the end, what will become the base of the piece, is not glowing orange anymore. So these are all things you learn as a glass blower who's been working with the material for 10 or 11 years. So really, really important to make sure the temperatures are just right. Even the most skilled glass blowers get a little bit of separation anxiety during this part of the process. A lot of work has already gone into this piece. We're looking at an hour of work off the end of the blowpipe right now. It would be a shame you know, if anything was off just a little bit, we would lose the piece. What a great shot. It'll roll back and forth. It'll center up the punty. Right now, the punty's hot enough they could wiggle it around if they wanted to. A couple drops of water on that tight constriction, holding the glass to the blowpipe. A tap on the blowpipe is going to break the glass exactly where Courtney wants it to break. Beautifully done. Let's give them a nice round of applause. All right. How long do you think this one will anneal for? Courtney. Just 8 to 12 hours, just a regular cycle. It is not a fairly thick piece of glass. In fact, most of the pieces up here on the stage did cool over 8 to 10 hours, 8 to 12 hours. Uh, the paperweights probably cooled over a little longer. And our, I know our bunny rabbit up here on the stage cooled maybe even for three days down to room temperature. So all glass cools at a rate due to its thickness. Thin pieces of glass like this one take a shorter amount of time. Thicker pieces of glass take longer. So paperweights in our co collection have annealed or cooled down over days, weeks, even months waiting in an annealer or oven to cool down to room temperature. Uh, the largest piece in our collection is the first casting of the polymer telescope. I've been told that that piece annealed over four months. They knew it was a failure, so they didn't let it cool quite as long as the one that's in use today. The polymer telescope lens that's in use today cooled over 11 months. 
so nearly a year, sitting in an oven to cool down to room temperature. Now that's because it is a disc that is 200 inches wide and 18 inches thick. That's a lot of glass. It weighs tons. We saw Courtney tapping on the glass. This will remove any chips that haven't stuck to the inside if they're not already there. You can also, if it's just the right temperature, if you caught it on the punty and there's any uneven edge that ends at the jack line, you can tap it and break it free. And as long as the jack line is on the opposite side, you wouldn't want to do that um, for just an uneven break. There are better ways to get an even edge to the opening of your piece. Right, so inside of our furnace, George is going to take two separate types of heats. A flash is something, a heat that we call an overall heat, a quick overall heat to make sure the base of the piece stays warm enough for long enough. Then he'll back out and start to heat the glass up where Courtney wants it to be heated. And this will be just the very, very, maybe top fourth of the vessel. Do have a slight orange glow to that white glass. So Courtney can pinch and pull. And she can also close it off. So that temperature control, I cannot stress it enough. Very important to get the hot the glass hot where you want it to move cold where you're done shaping it, you're happy with it. A cold to a glass blower is around 900 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, the glass stops moving. It becomes rigid and stable. But Courtney can't let it fall below that temperature, because if it does, it can crack and break from that thermal shock. This is something you've seen if you've ever dropped an ice cube into warm water and have it crackle, pop apart. It's that thermal shock. We have a newspaper pad. Uh, it's really wonderful. It's as close as Courtney will get to becoming the ceramicist or playing with the glass with the palm of her hand. She will get rid of those tool marks, start heating the glass up. And she does have a couple calipers on the bench. I think she's measured Measure the bumps and the openings. You're not going to use them? Well, I or used one, but, uh, you used one. Yeah. You don't need them all the time. Yeah, Courtney said she's made so many that one of the calipers she just didn't use. You know, if you go through the same motions over and over and over again, you pick up the same amount of glass over and over again, chances are you'll be able to make the same form over and over again. Um, a common question I get asked is, can you make repetitive forms all identical and the same? And a glass blower can. They can get fairly close to making identical forms. Uh, but I would argue that maybe that's not the best thing to do. Having a little variance is good, because it shows that the piece of glass was handmade. Some people strive for that perfection, but it's all up to the glass blower and the artist that's working with the material. Some people don't like bubbles in the glass where they don't want them. Some people don't mind them because that is part of the handmade process. It's all up to them. So there is a lot of machine-made glass out there in the world today. I, for one, am glad I am not making your pop bottles, windows, jugs, that type of thing. Uh, there is a lot of machines that make those bottles. Well, the last ribbon machine was closed down, but it could make a ton of bottles in a single second. It's an amazing piece of machinery. We have a video of it upstairs in the innovation stage. We also, I believe we have a video of it maybe on YouTube. Yeah. I know light bulb machines, they can make over 1,600 light bulbs in a minute. It's really amazing what machinery can do nowadays. Now, this is another common question. 
sorry, but you cannot keep the scraps on the floor. They are ticking time bombs. One, they're not annealed, so they're going to cool down at different rates and eventually pop apart. Uh, but they will be recycled, that being said. Glass blowers are among the first recyclers in history. Clear glass, when it breaks, we can throw it right back into the furnace and melt it back down and make something new and beautiful out of it. Colored glass will get recycled as well, but it goes to a company that pulverizes it. It can be used in construction materials, aggregate and concrete, asphalt roads, which are 99% recyclable because of the amount of glass within them. There's a machine called a reclaimer that chews up the asphalt road, recoats it in tar or asphalt, whatever it is, and then lays out the same material behind it. Um, so that's another amazing piece of machinery. It's also used as a layer in landfills in the United States. I've been told that um, you see them dumping layers of glass, this pulverized glass, it looks like sand. That helps contain the landfill. The weight helps push it down, degrade it over time, also aerates it so that it degrades faster. So here's that high-powered torch along with the fluffy torch. So Teresa is making sure that the punty doesn't get too cold. Courtney is going through and cleaning up the opening of the piece. And with this high-powered torch, she's going to be able to spot heat where she wants the bumps on her frog or frosted vase. She really wants to make sure it's a nice, clean, clean ending to where the color and clear come together. So, Courtney, how many bumps are you going to put in this, or where you cut through them? Three. Three. That torch is very similar to what flame workers would use. And so there are many different ways to work with glass. Flame working is one of them. They take a, a flame, just as the name implies, and stick rods of glass into that flame or tubes of glass into that flame and then do the sculpting. This is a hot shop, so furnace working is how it's normally described. But you can cast glass, pouring molten glass into molds. We're setting up chips of glass above a mold and then heating up the oven so it falls down, dribbles down into the mold itself. There's also warm working glass, so a lot of pendants. Uh, jewelry will be made that way. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, wine bottles that are turned into flat cheese platters. That's done in a kiln. So they heat that kiln up, they just stick a wine bottle in it, heat the kiln up, and that bottle slumps into a flat form. Oh, very, very like flame working there. Using a little bit of clear glass, winding it up into a ball. <laughs> and because they're working off of a blowpipe right now, they'll be able to blow into the material and get these, these bumps that Courtney will eventually cut through and leave the different holes for, looks like flowers would be the most common thing decorative elements to stick out of. Yeah. I don't know if I can ask that. Courtney, how much would you charge for these pieces? Now that she's been at Corning Museum of Glass, I'm thinking, I don't know. Depends on how big they are. Do you account for the time you've put into them? Like if you put more holes in it than the other, that one I would also. So as a, a you sell them at Penland Gal? Yeah, gallery. So I would suggest you go on online to Penland Gallery and look, look her up. Um, you know, I would, we look at a lot of things when we sell handmade glass. Uh, for 
person that's making a lot of production, say it's pumpkins or glasses, we are looking at the overhead of renting out a studio. Unless you have your own studio, which is nearly unheard of, owning a studio is a very big amount of commitment. Once you have molten glass in your furnace, you have to keep it running. That means someone has to be around to watch it and make sure that it's running still. Because if you lose power or gas to your furnace and that glass cools down too quickly, you can crack and break, ruining your furnace. Uh, so not a lot of glass blowers will have their own furnaces. You know, they, they look at studios like the studio here at Corning Museum of Glass and rent out time or take more classes. Uh, so we're looking at the overhead of renting out the studio time. Some studios will charge you uh, poundage per hour. So if you go over your allotted pounds per hour, you'll get charged for that. We also have to buy glass and its color. So there's a company called Reichenbach Online. They've been making colored glasses for nearly 200 years. They're based out of Germany. That's where we order a lot of our colored glass from. Colored glasses vary in their expense depending on what metal was used to create them. A green that was made with iron oxide uh, is a lot less in cost than a ruby red that was made using gold chloride. So the difference is great. Uh, the green iron oxide can be $35 per kilo, whereas that gold red, that gold ruby color glass can be $75, $80 per kilo. And so we have to find a line where we're paying for our materials too. Uh, Courtney, looking at this, would also pay her assistants, hopefully, right? And pay the people that are helping her to make uh, this piece of glass. You know, just to be a good assistant takes a long time to learn. Um, so to have a really great team that you can work with is worth the cost. Um, the assistants, a lot of the time, are glass blowers that make their own work. Um, it, it helps to have people that can make their own work and understand the process of production or artwork, sculpture versus goblets, that type of thing. Um, to have a person that is ready to go, know where they have to be, and bring the right sized bit or punty or colored shaped glass, to me is priceless. Um, it saves on your time because you can work on your glass without having to teach while you're doing it. You can make glass a lot faster with a really skilled assistant. Some glass blowers will trade time with their assistants even. My time is worth your time. I'll, you're going to work for me for three hours? OK, I'll work for you for three hours, that type of thing. And then we'll go out and get dinner together afterwards. I think that's one of my favorite things about being a glass blower is that we're, we're working with our friends. You know, it's a, a great environment. If we weren't in the amphitheater hot shop, live streaming right now, there would be music blaring and could talk about whatever you wanted to talk about. Um, Courtney's made so many of these that she might not even think about the process anymore. Um, she could talk, she could talk about uh, hockey or horses, whatever she'd want to, that type of thing. Yeah, so a big, big overhead though when you're looking at handmade glass, not only would she have to pay for all of these things, she would want to pay herself. Um, so we do look, we look at uh, accommodating an hourly wage for yourself in a piece of glass that you've made by hand too. There you go. So it is a, it is not a cheap hobby by all means, but if you're looking for something new to try, our friend Carl likes to say, if you want a hobby where you can burn and stab yourself all at once and pay, pay a good deal for it, this is, this is for you. I know there's a lot of glass blowers even that you know, have a day job and then they'll do this on the weekends. There's a, a gentleman out in Buffalo that will drive out to Corning Museum of Glass and work with one of our gaffers and create his own work even though he's a cardiologist during, during the week. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people travel from all over upstate New York, all over the world to come work and teach here at Corning Museum of Glass. 
Um, it is a world-renowned facility. Not only is our collection the largest collection in the world, solely devoted to glass, but our studio is world-renowned as well. We have a, a lot, a lot of glass blowers that come over. In fact, if you haven't been there yet, you, the Make Your Own is probably all filled up, but there are other galleries over there. People who have taught classes at the studio have work on display. These are people who are still alive and breathing today, creating their artwork and sharing it with the world. There's also the Frederick Carter Gallery that goes missed quite a bit. He's, he's a really big head in our area. He was one of the lead designers at the Steuben Crystal Glass Company. So he has a, a lot of glass over there as well. Um, there's not enough time today, but if you are around tomorrow, you know, not only will this piece be out on display, but you can head over to the Raycow Research Library. Um, that is another world-renowned facility. You can find anything and everything you want to learn about glass. Uh-oh. Oh. oh. <laughs> That was a good one. I'll let her know at, at, the, uh, at the end of the demonstration. You good? Oh. So for those of you just joining us on our live stream, this is Courtney Dodd. We're working on one of her vases, a frog or frosted vase. Uh, maybe we could pull that up on our television monitors, the vase that we have here on display, just to kind of remind people uh, what we are working on. Beautiful red flowers out of it. Thank you in the AV booth. Very nice. We're just finalizing the form with this high-powered torch. You can really see the light in the glass and how it's traveling through the material with that torch. using that blow hose now. You can see the glass start to move where it's the hottest. And this is how Courtney gets those bumps in the vase. Uh, she goes into the cold chop and then she'll cut through these, revealing the opening. She'll blow on the glass with her breath. This cools it down, controlling the temperature by any means necessary.
Now, so she'll switch up the spot that she's heating. She'll be able to blow into the glass and get another bump. We're going for three of these bumps. And this is one of the last things she does to these pieces in the hot shop. Again, she will cut through these, revealing the openings beneath them. And then she sandblasts the glass, taking away the shine, uh, but still leaving a nice, smooth surface. You can see where that torch has done a great job at heating up a very specific part of the piece. The glass will only move, again, where it's the hottest. So that blow hose becomes very important. So it lets her kind of blow into the glass and let her do the shaping instead of relying on her assistant who might blow a little too hard here or there. She knows exactly how much pressure to apply. So one more bump. Uh, another common question I'm asked is if you can breathe in. Uh, if Courtney did the opposite of blowing into the blow hose and breathed in, she would create a concave form. Uh, she wouldn't be worried about breathing in any hot air. Uh, not only does she have a blow hose that allows the heat to dissipate enough, but even if you s sucked in on the blow pipe, no hot air would be able to get to your mouth. The glass on the end of the blowpipe keeps you from being able to suck in all the air that's down there. Again, that stainless steel also dissipates the heat quick enough to where you would be at no danger of burning your lips or mouth. It looks like we're wrapping this up. If there are any other questions from our live streamers or here in the audience, this would be your, your chance to ask them. And we do have to cool the glass down slowly. 
This also becomes very important that the punty was the right temperature. And they may even break it off at the jack wine instead of breaking it off from the piece itself. There's a, a tight line in that punty. So it's all up, up to Courtney. Well, manually, manually even out the temperatures a little bit using this propane torch, allowing those bumps to cool down, but keeping the foot nice and hot. If there was a very great difference in temperature here, even if this piece was knocked off successfully and loaded into the annealer, if the temperatures were too great, too different, this piece could still crack during the annealing process. All glass uh, gets annealed. That's to say that it is slowly but steadily cooled down to room temperature. Again, that all depends on how thick or thin it is. We also have some fiber fracks in here. Because there will be a little bit of glass left on the bottom of this piece, we're going to lay it on its side on a very soft material called fiber fracks. It'll also kind of insulate the glass, keep it from getting scratched from the kiln shelf that's on the bottom of the annealer. We have George has put on some protective equipment, PPE, personal protective equipment. The Kevlar glo gloves will allow him to hold on to the glass and not burn his hands. The face shield will protect his face and hair while he walks this piece over to our 900 degree Fahrenheit annealing oven. There we go, a tap is all it's going to take. Very nicely done. Let's give them a nice round of applause. Beautiful, one of a kind piece by Courtney Dodd. George, Teresa, and the gang. Thanks so much for sticking around with us. Hope you enjoyed the demonstration, learned something new. If you have any other questions, feel free to come on down. Have a great night, thanks.